Now, we can't ignore the fact that the South had that sin of slavery. But nor can we ignore the fact that the North, in many ways, actually abused its power, particularly under the presidency of Abraham Lincoln. But once again, we always have to come back to that idea that it does actually take two parties, or at least two people, to cause a fight and to continue a fight. So we cannot entirely blame the North, nor can we entirely blame the South. We actually have to look at both of them and see that in both cases, each of these distinctive regions, each of these distinctive collections of people who both in many ways believe they were fighting for what was true, for what was just, for what was good and beautiful. Both of these in many ways had sins that they refused to actually admit, refused to actually confess. And after the war, after all the things had been settled or so it seemed, both of these sides maintained a grudge. They maintained a bitterness or they maintained some kind of improper position against the other. In fact, there's a famous Southern author of the 20th century. His name was Robert Penn Warren. He wrote a great novel called All the King's Men. And Robert Penn Warren also wrote a little book. It was called The Legacy of the Civil War. It's a great little read. It's only about 100 pages. And through that legacy of the Civil War, he really discusses this whole issue of what came out of the war between the states, of what the South and the North really passed on to their descendants, passed on to us. And what he says is that in the North, they passed on what he calls the treasury of virtue. What he simply means by that is because the North or the Unionists won the war, they essentially had the excuse to say that whatever they did was justified because they won the war, and especially because they did that moral grace of freeing the slaves. Of course, when you actually look at the war, you see that freeing the slaves really wasn't an ideal of most of the North. It wasn't really an ideal of much of the Union. It was something that was initially used as a military measure. Even though there were always abolitionists involved, there were abolitionists on both sides, North and South, it's just that the ones in the North tended to be a little louder than others. But that whole freedom of slavery was something that almost happened by accident. Still, we are, of course, glad that it happened, but we have to remember it wasn't as if it was an expressly deliberate, virtuous attempt by the North. But anyway, Warren says that because they had this treasury of virtue, it meant that whatever values they had afterwards, whether those values were correct or not, according to scriptural principles, he says that these values were seen as true because they had won. In other words, because they had victory, it meant that they must be right. For the South, he says they had an equally yet opposite problem, and he calls that the great alibi. In other words, the South could say, well, we lost the war, so essentially we might as well kind of give up. We might as well just say that that is enough, and if we ever do anything right, oh, that must just be an accident as well. In other words, this is the time when the South really begins to kind of go inward. This is the time when the South really begins to actually oppress the rights, especially of the freed African Americans. This is the time when the South really becomes impoverished. It's very curious. If you look at the states prior to the Civil War, you'll see that several Southern states were some of the wealthiest, especially per household, in all of the Union. But of course, after the war, those southern states became the most impoverished. They became the poorest. They became the places full of widows and orphans and full of ruined lands. And they became known not really for any kind of innovation. They did not become known for their wealth or for their advances. They simply became known as kind of backwards places. And in fact, that really is the reputation that often many of us in America or even around the world view the South as. In fact, if you look at your typical movie or if you look at a typical TV show, usually when someone, if you want to show that a character, for example, is hateful or bigoted or is stupid or something along those lines, you often give them a crass southern accent to actually show that. That comes out of that idea of the great alibi where the South in many ways just kind of gave up. They gave up not just in the war, but they even gave up at being righteous in the first place. In other words, as we take a look at these two significant problems, we have to kind of put them to the side and we have to realize principally, and here really is the principle I want you to record, that there were three things needed at the end of the Civil War. The first of those was justice. 
In other words, as we took a look at those freed African Americans, many of those who had been slaves, and of course many who had freely fought for the Union and for the Confederacy, the response should not have been, how do we keep them oppressed? How do we keep them marginalized and keep them from being actual productive members of our society or really being brothers and sisters in our country? And the question or the issue became that often those slaves were mistreated, both in the North and in the South. The other thing that was really needed at the end of the Civil War was mercy, specifically mercy towards your former enemies. It was the Southerners, those ex-Confederates, who often had great bitterness towards the victors. But it was also the victors, those who had fought for the cause of Union, many of whom had lost close friends or close family members fighting against the Confederates. They also harbored a great bitterness. And so mercy towards their former enemies was desperately needed, but all too often was not given. And then third, humility. As you can see, we're using the pattern from Micah 6.8. It's a pattern that we've mentioned before because it shows up again and again throughout history. And the whole idea of humility was that both the North and the South, following the Civil War, both needed to have a recognition that they both had sins. They both had sinned in the conflict. They both had sinned leading up to the conflict. This is a conflict, really, that could have been avoided. Still, what's remarkable about the end of the Civil War is that there were still good men. There were still men who wanted to actually see that reconciliation. Men like Robert E. Lee, who actually would become a great leader in education following the Civil War, even though his citizenship rights were essentially stripped from him. He would maintain a peaceful existence for the few years he was granted of life following the war. Of course, there's also men like Abraham Lincoln, who, as we have seen, it was many of his actions that actually escalated the war in the first place. But after Gettysburg, you begin to see a different man in Abraham Lincoln. And had Abraham Lincoln lived, had he actually been granted life beyond the war, which he was not due to the assassination, it's quite possible that Lincoln would have been one of the leaders, along with Robert E. Lee, towards reconciliation. But those issues, those virtues, I should say, of justice and mercy and humility, that was what was needed at Reconstruction. But unfortunately, it was not. And as we will see, Reconstruction in many ways was a continuation of the war simply by a different means.